All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Crypt of the Unknown, another art session here. Um, as you can see, it's kind of mostly sketched out. Um, what we're going to be doing today is American McGee's Alice in Wonderland. The reason being is because I'm going to try out my new Fudo and Suki Tombow pe brush pen. It's this brush pen right here. So glorious. Yeah, so glorious. By the way, I have a guest here with me. You want to introduce yourself? Hey, yo, Jesse Chavez here, here to rock out the party. How's it going, guys? Yeah, Jesse Chavez, good friend of the show. Uh, he's going to be sitting here with me. We actually <laughs> painstakingly recorded this already. And uh, but Jesse wasn't watching the drawing at the time. I was actually doing the drawing while we were recording. So some of my mannerisms while I'm speaking here on this new recording in the video are going to be different, obviously, because we recorded earlier. The sound quality was shit. Skype decided to make me echo. But other than that, here we go with uh, American McGee's Alice in Wonderland. And we're going to test out the Tombow pen. So, uh, Jesse, who I affectionately call Chavo. Oh, by the way, these are my Alice toys that I just got. I've been searching for them for a while. And this is uh, the Cheshire Cat. So anyway, that's what I was looking at while I was drawing that. That's my figure drawing. Man, the uh, details on those are uh, a lot finer than I thought. I've never seen them up close. Yeah, it's pretty. they are super neat. And I also have um, Tweedledee, Tweedledum, and Mad Hatter. So uh, anyway, I call Jesse Chavo. For anyone who's watching this, it's just a nickname I gave him. Long story. Uh, what's your experience with American McGee's Alice in Wonderland? Or just Alice, I should say. Uh, well, I mean, when it comes to Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, it's... I don't know. I didn't really grow up with the cartoon. It was mostly this demented 90s kids show on the Disney Channel, Adventures in Wonderland. That's what I knew it best from. As for, like, when I had my run-in with American McGee's Alice, uh, I'd have to say that was in high school. My uh, my best friend at the time was obsessed with this game. He loved it. He gave me a copy of the soundtrack, and I got really interested. Of course, didn't have a PC at the time to play it, but then when I got my first ever laptop back in, like, 2009, I managed to get my hands on a cracked copy, and... Uh, that pretty much sealed the deal for me. It was an excellent platformer, and I just loved playing it. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing old-school PC platforming game. I think my, my experience with it was the same, so I also got a crack copy. Uh, back in the day, you had to explain that. I think most people today know what a crack copy is. Sadly, um, mine also was made by a friend who forgot that he stocked his porn on there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh i do love this game uh american mcgee's alice and not just because it introduced me to the concept of free porn but also because <laughs> it's a fun game <laughs> was it was it alice themed porn or was it just generic porn oh it was like it was like some guy got his new camcorder and was like hey let's film, <laughs> let's film our home porn video honey Oh, damn, it's a shame. We could have went for the 1970s porn, like, musical they did for Alice in Wonderland. Good watch, by the way, for anyone who's interested. I'm sure it's somewhere online. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I've I've played it fairly recently as well. I think it was last year. Might have been the beginning of this year, but I uh, went through it again and still just an amazing game. I had I still had a blast with it, and I think it's just because of the art style, the way the map looks in it, the characters, Alice is a, um, you know, this is going back to year 2000. She's not a girl with big, gigantic boobs like Claire Croft. Uh, she's just this cute little um, innocent girl who happens to have this terrible incident happen to her where her house catches on fire, her family perishes in it, and she's stuck in an insane asylum. And the story kind of starts there. She has to go to Wonderland and basically set things right. It's, it's, I mean, Wonderland always to me, right? Chavo and to you probably too is just, it's Alice's mind when she's like 
got some sort of task in her real life that she has to fix. She goes to Wonderland to mentally fix it, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's what I like to refer to as like a neutral space. It's mm-hmm. you see you see it now and then in writing. It's kind of a spot where you know you can put things in perspective and externalize the internal. And uh, you don't want to lose your head while you're doing that, for sure. <laughs> Metaphorically or literally. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I really loved the that aspect of American McGee's Alice. I um, I think it was my first ever experiencing a traditional like children's property turned into a much darker story. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, I love that it's really, it's not even a reimagining of the tale of Alice in Wonderland. It's very much structured as if it was like a sequel to it. Right. It's like a continuation, very much so. Because the Alice in this game isn't really a little girl. She's a, she's a grown, well, I, w- I don't want to say a full grown woman, but she's definitely like in her late teens by this point. Because the fire that kills her family is when she's a child. And then it's just, it's a few years later while she's stuck in a Rutledge asylum. Yeah. Rutledge, um, a place where we come to find out that she's being mistreated. Tweedle, Tweedledee and Tweedledum in her mind are, uh, the people who take care of her. They're the attendant, um, guard. And they, it's it's just kind of in there, like maybe they violated her in some way. They definitely were starving her malnutrition, so she's going through a lot, and she's putting it all into Wonderland to again try and set things right for herself. Uh, an uncommon, uh, I, I shouldn't say uncommon, an unfortunate reality of industrialized London at the time. Mm-hmm. And and uh, in the early 1990s, uh, around Cyberdyne. <laughs> yes yes i'm pretty sure uh licking your patients is not is not a normal therapy yeah my uh friend asked me the other day at work he's like do you want some coffee i was like how about a beer <laughs> <laughs> um, must be my lucky day yeah that's a lot of terminator 2 references we don't really need to point out i'm sure oh don't don't worry we'll uh we'll we'll cram some more in over the course of this series yeah Uh, i have to draw something terminator related at some point too but yeah this um and i bring i brought this up in the original recording a lot but i got the tombow pen idea (laughs) it's not really an idea but i saw it was recommended by a famous artist named david finch who's done a lot of things in comic books. He even has his own YouTube channel. You can check that out after this, hopefully. But he was using a Tombow pen, and I just thought, wow, it just looks so like graceful and easy to use, and obviously this is my first time using it. So I'm trying to acclimate and get familiar with it, but um, it's just an amazing pen. And I got uh, six of them off the Internet for like 13 bucks, I think. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. And uh, they're just just amazing. I, I actually appreciate the Tombow more than my Micron pens. For anyone who's using Micron pens, maybe change it up to a Tombow and you'll you'll see what I mean. Fudo, Fudo no Suki is the full name. So forgive me for asking, you know, being kind of a basic bitch here, but uh, what exactly about it just makes it more comfortable for you? Is it the way it grips? Is it the way the pen flows? Yeah, it's like... um. It's like using, it's hard to explain, really. It, it really does feel like a brush, but it also at the same time feels like a pen. So, I mean, the name brush pen really does make a lot of sense. It's That's exactly what it feels like. And oh, yeah. No, I, I understand that for sure. It, it looks like it, fl- it flows. It looks like it flows a lot better than I a uh, normal ballpoint pen would, obviously. Uh- Oh, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've tried drawing with pens and have them, like, have a perfect line be screwed up by, you know, a bump or a skip. And I'm just like, well, I can try to fix that, but it's never going to look as good as if it was just one smooth stroke. (laughs) Yeah. Which brings up a valid point. Um, For everyone, 
well, I think I mentioned it in another video, but I actually do draw digitally more than on a physical paper. Um, not because I don't want to, but it's just so much faster. Like if so, if I want to color something all black, I just go click. It's black. You know, I don't have to sit there and take 30 minutes to do it. So this is this. I'm literally doing this just for the channel. Uh, and a matter of fact, right now, while we're recording this, I'm actually drawing something digitally while we're, everyone else is watching me draw this. I would imagine that also makes kind of getting copies, you know, of your drawings done a lot faster, you know, just kind of in terms of managing it. There's there's always something to said about having the physical copy, of course, but I imagine, you know, you don't have to worry about it getting damaged or lost quite as easily. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's digital and then I could print it out easier. It comes out 300 DPI and, you know, I... The thing, though, is that I will always say classic drawing on pen and paper with ink is always going to be better than digital drawing. There's there's nothing that will ever be drawing on pen and uh, paper. It's almost like it's a little more personal. Mm -hmm. And there's just something that the, the way it looks, it's just it's just amazing. Uh, and, and another thing, if uh, people don't know, the reason why I draw on 11 by 17, and obviously I'm not doing a good job here at the Tombow pen because I'm still trying to learn it, but uh, artists in the comic book industry, the reason why they draw so big is so that when they shrink it down, their lines actually look straighter. It's a little neat trick in the industry. So that's usually why I draw big in the hopes that when I do shrink it down, it looks better. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, because I do not have a steady hand. Well, I give kudos to you because you're drawing way better than I can right now. Yeah. Are you drawing right now, Chava? Uh, maybe, but it's definitely nothing I'm going to be comfortable enough to share with you. At least <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Just keep going over and over it. Eventually it'll look amazing, you know? Well, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll need to work out my skills the last time i actually took a serious attempt it was going off of one of those scholastic book fairs how to draw anime books with the most generic ass stock characters i have ever seen <laughs> <laughs> i think they even had a knockoff pikachu now that i think about it like it had the body structure but the ears were like way spikier and it's just like okay sounds about right it was I red <laughs> <laughs> I remember those uh, those classic book fairs always never having any money, but like wanting everything. I remember Goosebumps was there and they had those like Star Wars books where it's like, look at all the ships in great detail and stuff like that. And my phone is off. Really sorry about that. That's all right. Um, I'll probably have to cut that out. <laughs> Ch Chavo, the Silent Hill theme. I don't know if we'd get copyrighted for that, but I'll probably have to mute that out real quick. Uh, I'd definitely be wary of that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Alice in Wonderland, again... Probably one of the more elaborate stories about having some sort of trippy adventure than anything else I can think of. I mean, now today, even like even today, I still can't think of anything that's just so out there. Well, it's definitely uh, popular in that regard. I mean, you got a uh, Jefferson Airplane writing a song about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fill in that hookah, smoking caterpillar, don't do anything at all. Go ask Alice. Careful, we don't want to sing anymore, we might flag another copyright. I know. Sounds just like the lead singer to <laughs> Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> Slash Jefferson Starship. 
No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into another song. Ugh. But yeah, there's, uh, I forget what we were talking about last time. Cause again, we recorded this already. Oh man, we went all up and down the stratosphere and topics. Alice was, I think, present for 50% of the original recording. Mm-hmm. Oh, I did painstakingly ask you <laughs> to explain to everyone how um, Paul W.S. Anderson was trying to make uh, Alice in Wonderland part of the Resident Evil first movie project. Ah, oh, you son of a bitch. You're going to make me recount this again. Ah, <laughs> oh, you owe me a beer. Okay, so... The original concept for the Resident Evil film uh, was originally... It was supposed to be framed around Alice in Wonderland. That's why we have the titular Alice... The soldiers and stuff around her were to represent different characters. Kaplan, the dude who's constantly checking the time, you know, to make sure they're they're moving uh, at a good pace in the mission. He was based off of the White Rabbit. And I honest to God forget who the hell everyone else was supposed to represent. But I do know that, like, when they started production or pre-production on the film, like, he gave everyone a copy of the book. Whether or not they all read it outside of Miljovic, I don't know. <laughs> the only surviving bit of it is, like I said, Kaplan checking his watch constantly, like, and it's the time, we gotta know, like, we gotta know what time it is, we gotta know, we gotta hurry, we're late, we're late, we're late. Alice, you know, in her disoriented state, you know, in Wonderland, and the Red Queen AI, which they push so hard in that movie. Oh, and a zombie getting bludgeoned with an Alice in Wonderland paperweight, something that you wouldn't know unless they, like, you listen to the commentary for it because they don't have any cuts to the paperweight up close, so you wouldn't tell. Mm Hmm. Yeah, that's a very uh, telling story there. And even when I, I think I watched it the first time, I was like, why is this Red Queen Alice? What? Yeah, and it's, uh, I, they even joke about it, because I think in the commentary, they're just like, oh, yeah, it's a very, very high concept, Paul. You were, you were really on to something there. And it's, I, don't know, I think it's just funny, considering much like the sequels, he pretty much half-assed the entire thing. Which, uh, to, not to anyone's surprise at this point, given how many shitty Resident Evil movies we've had. Uh, at some point, he didn't even half-ass it. He quarter-assed it. <laughs> it was like it's like every movie after was fifty percent less as good as the one before it, until it was just not. There's nothing good about them at all. When your franchise starts actively punishing, remembering the previous film, that there may be a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I watched, okay, so I watched the first Resident Evil. I was, I was like telling all my friends, even the one who went with me to watch it, I was like, this is going to be the best thing you've ever seen. Just you wait. I was wrong. And, uh, then when the second one came out and I saw Nemesis, I saw Jill Valentine, I was like, Oh my god, this is going to be the best thing you've ever seen. Just wait. And I was with my sister. And we left the movie theater and we were both like, what was that? I don't know, Stefan. I feel like you got the less shitty end of the stick there. You want to know what the first Resident Evil film I saw in theaters was? Ooh, what? It was Extinction. It was the third film. The knockoff fucking discount dollar store version of Mad Max. That was what I got to see in theaters for that series. I would have fucking loved to have seen the first or hell, even the second one on the big screen. But with the third one, I was, I was underwhelmed. And then I saw the fourth one. 
And then I think I saw the fifth one, and that one I was so angry. I, I literally, I, I strongly considered getting up and walking out, and I have never in my entire life done that. Yeah, I would imagine. I I still remember. <laughs> I think because like the third one came out when Extin- Extinction came out. I was fortunate enough to be working at, at a carpet cleaning company. And what we would do every night is we would go clean the movie theaters here in the Valley of Arizona, or Valley of the Sun, Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, so I got to watch them all for free. Well, that one and the one after part four. Extinction. I I remember standing there because I didn't want to sit down. I was like, I don't think I'm going to sit down and watch this. (laughs) I I remember standing there and when when the zombies, the ninja acrobatic zombies piled out of the like cargo containment thing and they were all wearing like dune mad max clothes i was like okay i'm 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 done here i just i just walked out i was like that's i'm good oh well you 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 didn't didn't think that was you didn't think they were scary you didn't think they were intimidating uh ninja mad max acrobatic zombies Mm -mm. Uh, but now I want to do a comic book called Ninja, Mad Ninja Acrobatic Zombies. <laughs> I feel like that would take place in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles universe, and I think I'd be okay with that. I want to do that now. I'm calling up Kevin Eastman. Kevin, I got an idea. <laughs> I blow your mind. I'm like, well... I... I could use a new a new paycheck. Yeah, sure, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I've got to pay for that uh, tank gas somehow. I wonder if I don't even know if he still has the tank, but <laughs> he has Kevin, a tank. Yeah, when Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird hit it big with Teen- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, one of the first things Kevin Eastman bought was an actual tank. <laughs> <sighs> you know, I want to judge, but honestly. All the power to him. <laughs> yeah, what a cool purchase. Seriously. I mean, knowing you, you'd probably fucking just build a Spencer estate replica or some shit. Uh, I promise myself, if I ever make a million dollars, I will spend 90000 of it to buy myself a remade Batman 1989 Batmobile so I could drive it everywhere. <laughs> Now, if anyone wants to start a GoFundMe for me, just just cruise up, just be like, "Hey, who wants to be my Vicky tonight?" And the girls are just like, "Oh no, <laughs> you ain't Batman, you Bat Boy." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> remember that? <laughs> I do, I do. I I actually remember the very first time I ever saw that movie too. <laughs> I uh, wish I didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This uh, part here with the boot, when we get to it, people will notice that I add a third latch here at the bottom. And um, <laughs> I wasn't happy with it. So I tried to white it out, but I didn't shake the bottle enough because I'm a dumbass. So at the end of this, you will see it. It is gone. And that is because I finally shook the bottle. But ignore that third bootstrap. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it never did. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this game really is trippy. <laughs> mm. Oh, um, we should also mention the soundtrack. Um, who was it by again, Chavo? It was the drummer? Uh, from Nine Inch Nails, I think. Chris Brenna. Mm-hmm. Although I'm paranoid, and I really should double-check that just to make sure, and so we don't get, like, angry comments. It's like, no, dipshit! It was other guy. <laughs> it was not Trent Reznor! Now you're playing with power. 
Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nine Inch Nails drummer. Okay. Yeah, he, um... Oh, man. That Dr. Pepper hits the spot. He, uh... <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> Are you thirsty right now and need something refreshing? <laughs> Yeah, he made an amazing soundtrack for the game. One of the, the the greatest parts and achievements of it, actually, I think, that I enjoy the most is the fact that they asked him to do it because he was a big fan. I think they were all big fans of Doom. And American McGee was working at id for a short amount of time, if nobody remembers. He was working on Doom 2 and then Quake afterwards. And uh, so that's probably how they got into contact there. And... Um, what he used to make the soundtrack was a bunch of children's toys. And that's what you hear literally for the jingles and tunes in the video game, which is just, it's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. You don't, you don't see that technique employed too often. The only other time I've experienced it was when I was, uh, doing theater and I was in a production of Coraline, the musical. We used a lot of toy pianos and like junk sound effects. See, that sounds awesome. Oh, do you want to plug what you've, uh, some of the work you've accomplished here, Chavo? Um, because I'm not the only one who has done things. Um, you've done some stuff too, Chavo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I wrote a play a while back called Stripped. Uh, it's about a kid who's navigating his own uh, fractured psyche while he's trying to piece together his uh, personal trauma, which... I guess is actually pretty uh, tangentially connected to this to this game. <laughs> now that I think about it, cause I'm pretty sure Alice does the exact same thing in uh, American McGee's Alice. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I uh, I staged a workshop production of it my final semester of college back in 2015. Did a workshop reading of it. Uh, a revised version, I think, a year later. And then 2017, we actually had a production of it put on at one of the local community theaters. And uh, it's, I gotta say, it's quite the experience watching uh, people like breathe life into the words you write, you know? Like yeah. seeing it happening right in front of you. It's gotta be the best feeling. It's so many things all rolled up into one. It's exhilarating. It's terrifying. It's aggravating. It's wonderful. It's it's a weird sense of kind of feeling infinite for a bit. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, and there's even, like, if anyone's interested to actually see the play, it is on YouTube. It's under just Stripped, I believe. Yeah, Stripped by Jesse Chavez. Mm-hmm. So don't type in stripped by Chavo. Just remember, it's Jesse Chavez. Oh, that's my other channel. You, trust me, you guys don't want to see that one. <laughs> or do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's an acronym. It's C dot H dot A dot B dot O. <laughs> <laughs> what could it mean? But, um, yeah, I'm trying to get back in the writing game and work on some other projects. I have a couple different plays that I'm kind of structuring and trying to put together right now. I don't want to go into detail about the story too much, but I'll say one of them is called After Image and uh, the other is Contact. Oh, okay. I think you've talked to me about them a little bit. Yeah, After Image is... a suicide survivor trying to kind of figure out their place in the world after a botched attempt and, you know, repair and maintain new relationships. And Contact is about a guy who is trying to find intimacy in the digital age, which I think is especially relevant now, given the current circumstances. It sure is. And if I'm lucky, I'd really like to get into writing for comics at some point. I have a cool anthology series that I'd really love to do. 
that I'm going to call Blood and Neon, which will be like 10 different stories that all take place during uh, the 1980s. Yeah. I've actually kind of been the, I don't know, what would you say, Chavo, the progenitor for everyone around me saying like, oh, man, comics. Yeah, writing for comics. That doesn't sound like a bad idea because uh, that's literally all I talk about. And um, anyone following this channel should know by now that that's literally what I'm also trying to do. That's that's my whole dream. That's the reason I do all this. Uh, a Kickstarter will be announced soon at some point. Um, not right now, unfortunately, because I have to shoot the video and edit it and make it look neat and fresh and hip and rad. And, um, you know, put the whole thing together. But the actual comic itself, which there will be an announcement again soon, but it's done. So we're all ready to go on that end. I'm looking forward to having it on my shelf. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, I can't wait to see people's reactions because it's very relevant to the <laughs> our generation. Ooh. I won't say no more. I'll leave an air of mystery. That's how it works. <laughs> mm. Anyone... um watching the art though at this point can see that i'm not 100 percent doing straight lines obviously i go fix them later in post uh this was more so to just get a feel for the brush at this point i still i'm just like a toddler i'm still learning to crawl and walk but mm. it's slowly coming to me gotta learn to walk before you can run yeah so I love the detailing on the pocket. I would, I would have probably struggled with those character the the symbols on her on her fabric. Oh, thanks. I never noticed the netting under her. Uh, the oh God, what's the word for it? They're not like her shoulder poofs or whatever they are. Hmm. Her uh, her Jill Valentine pads. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully those are bulletproof. <laughs> Alice comes with ballistics too. <laughs> ballistics me, ballistics you. Uh, she wielding the uh, Vorpal Blade. Mm hmm. I got to be careful now. They had to censor the original cover of this game when it was released multiple times. The Vorpal Blade was considered too violent, and the Cheshire Cat was considered too creepy. I think the final variant of it was her just holding the wand from the game. Yeah, and then I think there was one where I don't think she's holding anything in one of them, too. Probably not, you know, but I'm still chuckling at the thought of like some mom being like, well, my kid likes those Harry Potter books. This must be something similar. It's from the company that does the Harry Potter games. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but uh, there's so many variants they released of that front cover because of all the censorship that I think they're all like worth different amounts, like for the resale value for them, like changes depending on which variant it is oh yeah it's like uh almost like a comic book cover exactly i mean honestly when it comes to video game resales people will find just about anything they can say that makes it unique and charge more for like for example i have the uh black label version of final fantasy 7 on ps1 which is notorious for having a misprint on the back where it's, you know, there's an I in the word masterpiece that's printed in the completely wrong spot. And some people will actually go on eBay like, it's the rare misprint version, $500. And it's like, no, no, that's that's common. <laughs> that's the first copy, man. 
Ah, oh, don't be like that dude on Pawn Stars who is like, I have an NES model 001. That's worth a, that's worth a ton of money. And they're like, actually, it's it's a very common console. They did plenty of prints of these, and also, um, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, something I never actually... I don't think I've ever looked on any of my old NESs if uh, there's 001. It's basically the first model that mm-hmm. came out. That's not the top loader. I, I don't think there... There wasn't many revisions of it like consoles these days where it's like the 1S, the, the Pro. Didn't the PSP do that too, 001? Or was it 1000? Wait, what was that? Didn't the PSP also have like a 1000, 2000 series, 3000 series or something like that? Yeah, yeah, actually it did. The 1000 was the fat brick. The 2000 was kind of in between. I had the, the 3000 was the slim model. That's the one that I have. Mm. And then I believe they did a 3001, which removed Wi-Fi capability, which honestly, I wish I could get my hands on a copy of that since the Wi-Fi on the 3000 can't connect to jack shit. It's too outdated. Yeah, and they they were smart with the 2001s. They knew not to go that route. <laughs> oh, and then there's, of course, the PSP Go, which was download only. They didn't have the UMD slot. Oh, yeah, that was a terrible idea. People hated that. Yeah, I hear the buttons were kind of shit on that one. I don't remember if I've ever played one. I know I've played the uh, different models, though. I think my friend had a Slim, and I played some Battlefront on it, which was a terrible port, but (laughs) somehow we still got enjoyment out of it. There's, There's always something to be said about terrible ports or bad games. You know, much like bad movies, there's if you can find something to enjoy in it, it's not a total loss. Mm-hmm. Like most people hate the Super Nintendo version of Home Alone, but it's my favorite port. Yeah. I mean, I want to say Resident Evil Extinction is probably the only thing you can't find enjoyment in ever in life. Oh, God, that's not even the worst one, though. (laughs) (laughs) It really isn't. I think I saw the fourth one. A friend owned it, and he's like, here, you want to watch this? I'm like, not really. (laughs) But you're going to let me borrow it, sure, I guess. I got nothing to do today. Wasn't that the one where they had literally had like a basketball player like do a super jump and pull a plane from falling off of a roof of a fucking skyscraper? Mm-hmm. <sighs> That's think... not even the worst one. <laughs> yeah, I think Chris and Jill are in it. I don't remember. Uh, Chris yeah. is in it. Yeah, no, Jill. <laughs> I, I, I honest to God think the actress must have pissed off either Miljovich or Paul W.S. Anderson. Probably when she was like, oh, I can't be an extinction. I'm too busy being an Aragon because that's going to be a, a franchise. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Lord of the Rings. Uh, still the right choice, honestly, because, yeah, no, they... <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, you know the rules of the Resident Evil movies. If you're cooler than Mila Jovovich, you're dead. You're fucking dead. <laughs> you're dead to me. Dead. Just ask Michelle Rodriguez. They killed her like 15 times. <laughs> the chick who did play um, Jill in the Paul W.S. Anderson movies, though, when she did go to Aragon, I was like, I didn't even recognize her, actually. I was like, who's this hot babe? And then later on, I was like, oh my gosh, it's that same chick that played Jill. No I wonder. I have a hard time. It's like a cognitive dissonance. I just, I can't really match her face when it's not where she does, when she doesn't have the hairstyle, which is great because she's, I think she's a natural blonde. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it's weird. Yeah. I think she was happy when they brought her back later when uh, 
she was supposed to be blonde is that terrible version of Jill. Oh, the five. R- the RE5 yeah. version. It was still mm-hmm. great seeing her. I just, it's a shame, you know, because it's like, that's the last time we'll ever see her. <laughs> mm-hmm. We've gotten way off top of Gavalis and, uh, of Alice, and uh, I, I just want to let everyone know, we're probably just going to stay off the topic of Alice because it's really not much to say that people don't already know. And the game, as much as I love it, it's, it's just Alice in Wonderland again. And, you know, it, it's better experience played, honestly, more than talked about, in my opinion. Well, it's either that, you know, I mean, we have a lot of video to fill here, and it's either that or I'm I'm just going to go on a long, long rant about how I hate Tim Burton at some point. And <laughs> I'd rather not go down that path again. <laughs> now, mind you, I don't hate his movies, his past movies. Uh, I'm just not a fan of his take on Alice. Mm-hmm. especially considering that probably came at the cost of an actual film adaptation of uh, American McGee's Alice. Mm. We almost got that uh, starring Sarah Michelle Geller as Alice. That would have been so glorious. I'm, I'm very curious to see how it would have uh, worked out being a early 2000s horror, horror film, most likely. I still think they should do it. Sarah Michelle Gellar could pull it off. She's not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think she's kind of burnt out on like acting, acting. I mean, years and years and years of being Buffy would do that to somebody. Mm-hmm. Well, she's married to Freddie Prince now, right? Yeah, yeah, she's got her arm candy. Good for her. She seems like a good person. Good God, what a schnoz. Mm. Not not Sarah Michelle Gellers. Her face is wonderful. I'm, I'm talking about this this ugly mofo right in front of us. The, oh, yeah. Mad Hatter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, this video and the next, I want to say, one or two videos. I have to look somewhere on my desk here. But these are things that I had already sketched out before I decided to put them on the show and literally the reason was to test out the Tombow and just kind of get acclimated with it and you know um, a little adept but I figured why not just record it and do like a little mini podcast episode over it talking about you know Alice or whatever and then you know make it another art session because I mean people do want to see these things in action so here you go while i'm not the greatest artist on the planet at least you get to see it work how it works how it looks well i'm kind of excited to see what other projects you work on with the with this pen because like you said you know you're kind of getting adjusted to things and you're kind of you know learning as you go and it can only get better from here really yeah that's true um people should always take away too is the fact that like and Chavo, I, everyone probably gets annoyed with me at some point, but they're always like, what are you doing? Uh, drawing. What are you doing? Drawing. It's like you have to practice constantly. Otherwise, you'll never get better. So uh, it's, the, it's the same as writing, really. Yeah. You, you have to stay on top of it or you will get rusty. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it's a... It's a hard thing to tell people. Like they're like, oh, I want to like do scripting. How do I do scripting? It's like, well, practice. Well, I need to write first. Okay, practice. Well, it's for my comic that I gotta draw somehow. Practice. <laughs> like, there's no easy solution. You have to put time in to get something out of it. It's like uh, exercise or something. You're not gonna get any muscles by sitting on the couch. Yeah, exercise, learning how to play a new instrument. Any any skill you want to require, it's going to take time and discipline, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, we can't all be Hannah Montana where we just, you know, have a rich musician father and then toss on a hooker wig and all of a sudden all the kids want to hang out with us. <laughs> that was a dark analogy. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is... Uh... 
you know, it's, it's literally the best advice I could give anyone, give myself even, you know, it's, I've been writing a long time. Um, if anyone read my first book, oh my God, those first couple of pages, even, I mean, I get better near the end, but like that first book, the second book, all of the books, God, they're just, they were just so bad. And, uh, I feel bad because I go back and look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I, at some point I, I paid somebody to read this and edit it and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, it's just bad. That would have been a painful experience for those people. <laughs> well, I don't call them growing pains for nothing. Mm hmm. So, you know, it's take practice, take, uh, Take all the time you need, really. Just don't get uh, older like me and then still expect to have the same endurance. You know, I really have to work for it. That's why I do work out and I do try to eat healthy most of the time. But, you know, you got to you got to stay in the zone and just practice, practice, practice. That's the best advice you can give anyone when trying to accomplish or do any task that requires a lot of skill and some people are just fortunate enough where they don't need to actually like uh chavo said you know i there's a lot of people who are, are artists who just came out the gate and were just badass like the guitarist for boston let's take the band boston for instance he wrote his first guitar solo for their album in like a year i can never do that but some people are just like that I, I, however, knew I was going to have a knack for writing more than I would for drawing. The only reason I started drawing was because I figured at some point I would have to draw my own comic book. I, I wasn't going to be able to afford an artist. That's the only reason I did it. But I don't have a steady hand. So there you go. Even even I can admit that. So if you have a steady hand, you're already one one step ahead of me. Hmm. Sorry, I'm watching the footage right now. Uh, I'm uh, really digging the shadow work. I have such a hard time when I'm trying to do like illustrations and stuff. It always ends up looking like I'm just smearing black all over. <laughs> mm -hmm. It never feels quite uh, authentic. One of the, like, little mechanics, and one of these days I'll have to do, like, a little tutorial video or something, but one of the mechanics of drawing characters to try and make them look 3D as opposed to flat objects, and I and I said this in, I think it was the Jason video, but you want to picture, like, the head or, like, his nose, for instance, here as a 3d object so like the shadows where would they go you know on that 3d object and I, I gotta admit i didn't quite focus on shadows on this one as hard as i normally would but it was only for the tombow i i still think it came out pretty cool yeah it was fun certainly got a sneer down mm -hmm, yeah that was the thing earlier in the video when i'm doing his eye it's like ah oh, it looks too friendly so i like tried to make it darker real quick and i'm like okay there it is <laughs> yeah because he's definitely not a friend in this version mm -hmm. and you know anyone who notices i <laughs> i try to do his ear here and then it just kind of looks like a thumb a sore thumb <laughs> he just he chewed up an ear and slapped it on the side of his head and it's good enough mm -hmm. we call that one the van gogh <laughs> but yeah i think i think i forget what his like whole goal is in the video game but i remember he does have the dormouse and uh some something else tied up oh god was it was it the march hare too yeah that's what it was it's really sadistic. Like, it's just sort of like, oh, God, you've been experimenting on your friends. What's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So while we're watching this, I guess I could ask, uh, what's uh, what's your favorite iteration of the Mad Hatter? Hmm. Maybe the one from this game because I genuinely like the way he looks. I mean, again, the art style is just phenomenal. Um, yeah, I, I do love the steampunk approach they took to his character model design, too. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I would say the game because I. I mean, the thing is, is like when they tried to give Johnny Depp's Mad Hatter some character and depth and give him a backstory and all that, like I, I genuinely was interested to see where it would go. But once it started going, I was like, this was a bad idea. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need the Mad Hatter to have a genuine background. I just need him to be mad. Uh, if I, I think if I remember right. The whole impetus of the Mad Hatter was supposed to be because Hatters at that period in time went mad normally because their job had them working with Mercury to you know to make those hats and get them stiff and to hold their shape, and the Mercury would seep into their skin and they'd basically end up kind of going insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's. And there's nothing ominous about Johnny Depp's Mad Hatter at all. He's just very weird, <laughs> to say the least. I wouldn't say he's the worst part of the movie for me. I mean, as a whole, like, I can't... I don't want to be, like, one of those irate fanboys who are just like, uh, it's nothing like the stuff he did before. It's crap. It's, it's too soft. It's whatever. It's just, it's one of those things where it's like, I feel like I know the director can do better, and it just feels kind of lazy. Yeah, it's, it's when you become too close friends with a director, you guys just like, you're so buddy-buddy that there's no, uh, you know, there's no weight to your art anymore. You're just kind of like, ah, oh, you want to do another zinger? It's it's the Sandler effect, you know? It's just like, hey, want to go on vacation and make a movie around it? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, you gotta get my wife in on the action. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> that sums up his career. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's just uh, something about the passage of time. Because I definitely loved the ambition and his earlier stuff. Edward Scissorhands is definitely a Christmas time favorite of mine. There's mm-hmm. a lot of Tim Burton movies that actually fit really well around Christmas time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that's a that's a common thing I've seen with like a lot of artists, a lot of actors. I mean, most actors, most artists. Um, most people who are successful, I mean, after a certain amount of years, you quit trying to be at the top of the game, you know, and I get it. It's harder and harder. And, uh, I forget who said the quote, but somebody said something like, you know, your, your twenties, your thirties are a young man's game. But once you get into your forties, you don't have that thirst to the same thirst to that you had then to like, you know, push forward through anything and just try to be as successful as you can. And I think that's true. As as you older you get, you know, you you probably do lose some of that muster. And then that's like you even you can even see it in bands today. Like once they put out like all those badass albums, and they get older, it's like, oh man, they just don't have it anymore. You know. So, oh god, let's see. That's that's tough. Like I do think there are there there are exceptions. There are people who definitely push past it, but it's. It's definitely true when uh, you it's very it's very obvious and apparent when an artist loses the hunger, you know, 
mm-hmm. that drive to you know step it up, you know, and push and do more. Or, uh, you know, if they are things that they do in their personal life takes away from that hunger, like, you know, Tim Burton got married and Helen and Bonham Carter and, and Johnny Depp. I don't Depp think they ever. Married. I don't think they ever actually got married. It was like a domestic partnership. Oh well, you know what I mean. Though they're, they're kind of settling down more, and you know, it's maybe not them. It's essentially them, but you know, I just think kind of overall, like if I if I'm talking comic books, generally artists have to kind of be at the top of their game. Always, generally, that's not true for everyone. Some people get away with it, like. People will shit on Frank Miller or uh, John Romita Jr. or whoever, but I won't because I still remember their work and I know they have it in them to do good work, whether they do or don't, is kind of significant because they, you know, in comics, if you really proved yourself over a decade, let's say, or I mean, in Frank Miller's case, you were at the Dark Knight Returns when he was like 28, 29. If he did that, <laughs> I mean, do you really have to prove anything else? <laughs> <sighs> no, it's just I've never been one to support resting on one's laurels. Like it's like, oh, it's great that you did that, you know, and that piece of art is never gonna be, you know, forgotten. Everyone's gonna love it. It's great. It's great. So what else? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's the that's the thing that I always do too. But I I have a terrible knack of overworking myself, as you well know, Chavo. And I mean, at this point, I've already written like I want to say thirty issues to comic book ideas I have. I mean, I just went ham on it for like two months, and I was just like, boom, one done, boom, one in the can, two in the can, three in the can. So. <laughs> I don't know, but then again, I'm still in my 30s. <laughs> so, I again, I I just I don't subscribe to the thought of it. You know, I just I feel like you could still be hungry well into your 40s and 50s. It really just depends on how much success I think. Like maybe it's the su- success itself that changes you, but when your ass is on the line, I feel like that when that fire is underneath you, you're still going to move. You're still going to push. Mm-hmm. I'm only gotta, you know, I don't think I will ever lose. Um, I guess it's kind of pretentious, but I guess I'll never lose that. Cause I just, to me, like creating things is the greatest feeling. Creating things and sharing them with people and letting other people share with you the things they create. You know, it's, it's always the best thing to me. Yeah, uh, for me, it's, again, it's just seeing different people putting on and, and interpreting my work. It's seeing something continue and knowing that eventually it'll continue without my direct involvement and it'll adapt and it'll grow over time and it'll just... I don't know, just be something that's out there and it's kind of its own entity after a while. Yeah. A lot of uh a lot of famous people too got famous by accident, you know, and sometimes it was late in their life, sometimes it was early in their life. It all varies and you never know when it is. A like the actor John Hamm, he didn't get into acting. He was a waiter. So I think he was mid thirties and then you know, on comics, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, those guys were into their forties when they created Fantastic Four. So I mean you just you never know, really. It's it's a it's a ballpark out there, you just have to hit the ball. Yeah, see, so there's there's plenty of holes in that theory right there. Mm-hmm. Don't for, don't forget Alan Rickman, um I don't think he hit it big until he was like in his mid to late thirties when he did Die Hard. Like oh, he was man. he was actually fairly old, like getting up there by that point and he'd been trying unsuccessfully to be an actor up until that point. And it paid off. Yeah, well didn't he do uh 
stage performance, though? Wasn't he like a stage performer before he was like a movie actor? Oh, God, I don't. I, I, I yes, but again, I don't think he was seeing the amount of success that any actor out there would hope for. It's mm-hmm. it's a difficult line of work, you know. Speaking from experience, it's loving an art form that absolutely, positively does not love you back. <laughs> <laughs> could see that yeah which is another thing i guess i should touch on for anyone who wants to be an artist whether it's drawing writing acting whatever make sure that you know when you're doing it you're doing it for yourself you're not doing it for the fame or the glory because trust me there's little to none to be had really Mm mm-hmm you have to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, because if not, it's it's going to fold you. Yeah, and don't let success go to your head. I, I think one of the things I always remind myself is, you know, remember where you came from. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to go back there, but always remember who you are. Write Disney movies. <laughs> <laughs> Write every Disney movie. Just remember who you are. It's deep inside of you. The power. <laughs> Just around the river bends. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just the bare necessities. God, we are so getting copyright striked. <laughs> as long as before, we weren't going to do it. Bringing Disney in sure as hell will. Yeah. You're like, no. We recognize that audio clip. (laughs) Oh, it counts as a cover. (laughs) Well, you still got to pay us. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, this is um, is also a rare moment, too, in these uh, art session videos. Um, I'm only going to do 100. I've told myself I'm going to do 100 of them. And then after that, I mean, that's it. So this is a rare opportunity where we're still early on in the recordings where anyone can shout out and be like, hey, you know, draw Mega Man or, you know, draw Rob Schneider's face. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Just anything you can you can recommend anything to me i won't guarantee i'll do good do a good job but as of right now i i am taking requests uh we we as long as it has something to do with the show that's all that matters so so once you reach your hundred then you're gonna have to slap a disclaimer on this ballot offer no longer valid do not ask Mm -hmm, pretty much so a rare time when you have an artist at your disposal. And I'll say your name on the show, too, if you want me to. Well, it makes me almost want to do a weird outlandish request. <laughs> Draw a weird owl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could. Jesus, he certainly... I've actually uh, had the pleasure of uh, being his bodyguard for a night. He is... One of the most wonderful people I have ever met. I believe it. Dude had fans who were absolutely sobbing, and me being a nervous person would not be comfortable around that, but he was all, he was cool as a cucumber, taking pictures with them, thanking them. Absolutely total sweetheart. Yeah. I don't think anyone ever in space and time has said a bad thing about Weird Al. He's just a cool dude. Class act all the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. Actually, I, what I'm working on right now is your Christmas card, Java. <laughs> uh, so it's a big rainbow fuck you? Yep. <laughs> you nailed it. And when I open it, it's going to shoot dick confetti all over my face? Yep. That's it. Because, I mean, honestly, that's so me. So I'd I'd be very okay with that. (laughs) 
He's like, oh, you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> not here, not here. Off the show, off the show. <laughs> Get a hold of yourself, Chavo. <laughs> oh. Shot off that Tombow again. Yep. Again, it is the Tombow Fudenosuke brush pen. Mm. One of these days, I'm going to have to help you get one of those home shopping network setups where it's like its own cushion. And it's just, <laughs> as you see, it's easy to grip. Tombow. <laughs> you can even put it in your pocket. <laughs> Not responsible for ink stained pockets. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, um, another uh, moment where someone can tell me if they want me to just do uh, like time lapse videos. Uh, at the end of this, there will be time lapse to finish the drawing because I don't. I mean, after two hours, I think we kind of. It's like, all right, I'm just going to do the rest time lapse. I wasn't moving fast enough. We were chatting too hard. It's sad that that audio got lost, but we're basically covering the same ground now. But it's I mean, a rare opportunity if somebody also wants me to do time lapse going forward, because as much as I enjoy these, it's very painstakingly hard to get them from my phone to my laptop and then edit them back together after taking them apart. Um, I should I should mention that because I do record these with my phone. I have a little like phone tripod I bought for five dollars across the street from where I live at a five below. I think the store is called. Oh, I was like, why does it sound like something's boiling? It's raining outside. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. And uh, so basically, I put my phone on the tripod. That's what. That's why you're getting this view. I tried it the other way, where I <laughs> stacked a bunch of books together. And I put chopsticks in between them, and then I rested my phone on it as an overhead view. That didn't work out so well because I wasn't able to get my drawing hand to move that much with the books next to it. I need uh, to find you like a phone tripod or a phone crane set up they exist i know they do <laughs> yeah and my sister said she has one of those like uh tripod lights the, the the circular lights where you put it above it so it gives it perfect lighting yeah a lot of uh youtubers who do the talking directly into the camera use those mm -hmm. and uh so i just need to go pick that up from her and at some point i am going to get one of those um crane lighting things i know i'm gonna get one for my microphone too because it's it's itself is also on a tripod but anyway back to what i was saying so if we record it let's say this is two hours long right which at some point it will cut and go to part two because we took a break in the middle of this but every 10 minutes i record i have to go into my phone and say okay make new video 10 minutes long then it makes a new one. Okay, make new video 10 minutes long of the next 10 minutes of the video. So then when it's broken up, it's broken down into six videos for the hour. And then I have to upload them one by one. And then I have to turn them from MKVs into MK4s. And then I have to kind of watch them to put them, splice them all back together. And then, you know, create a title card and then do the ending music, and then do the time lapse, and then put it all all the time lapse together, which is also a dumb little chore as itself. So these things do take a while to produce, um, but I want to know if these long ones are worth it, because if they're not worth it, then why just not do like a quick time lapse video and be done with it, right? So. Um, if people can let me know that, that I'd be very grateful. <laughs> I know some people do enjoy the process and some people are just like, oh, let's watch this guy draw this thing real quick while I'm on the bus to work or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the beauty of YouTube really is, you, I, I, I feel like there's room for both, you know, you could always do the time lapse and then like have a link in the description for like, you know, the full scale, like the full 
length drawing process. Because mm-hmm. especially for people who are learning to draw, I'm sure they'd love to just you know sit and watch the finer details of technique that they wouldn't be able to catch in that. Yeah, and um, it's actually a process that I see used a lot in uh, Lego videos on YouTube. Like they'll have the time lapse video where they rush through and build the whole thing. But it'll be like a massive set with like thousands of pieces. So they'll also have their like full length, like, okay, here's the actual like building process for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a hard row to hoe because um I only use my phone, so it can only do one or the other. It can only do time lapse or lengthwise uh full video. And as of this recording, I just released an actual time lapse video called Dream Girl or something. I think I named it. It's just a girl drawing, like a pinup. And uh, it didn't get as many views as these longer ones. So I don't, I just don't know where the ground is on that, the ground level, because it's, it's hard to tell. I don't know if it's just because the, the drawing or if it's because it's time lapse. You know, you never know. Hmm. But uh, YouTube's a process. I'm still trying to learn it. I feel like it's not quite... It's never quite possible to actually master YouTube. It changes too much. Mm -hmm. Most you can do is kind of stay ahead of it. Yeah. But, um... If people are confused, like most of the time, because I don't do a rough drawing for some of this, um, some things are just obvious, like his shoulder where it is, it's just obviously right there that he's a hunched over, so it's going to be near the ear. Some things when you draw, like figures, like, like an obvious thing is if you drew like a person just standing there with their hands at their side. One of the things you would always know is that their hands are going to, their fingers, where they're hanging, are going to reach the middle of the thigh. That's how you knew you drew proper form of the figure, because it's just an, ob- an obvious thing. And over time, as you practice figure drawing, which everyone should start with, I didn't, because I'm dumb, uh, you'll learn those little, like, shortcuts, because just just the length of things and the way they're they're built the way that your back like if you're hunched over right now you know your shoulders are going to be near you know your ear in his case i made them a little higher because he's a cartoonish version of a person so obviously you go a little bit extra like like in comic books when someone shouts they don't shout like a person would shout in real life they scream it you know because you got to have that action so that that's my advice. Start with figure drawing. Is that what you're drawing, Chava? <laughs> Maybe. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drawing a beautiful drawing of Jill Valentine. Oh uh, yeah. It's just a stick figure with boobs and shoulder pads and the, <laughs> a, a loop for the beret. <laughs> And it's just got a big star in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's lopsided. Yeah. Look what I did, Mom. <laughs> oh, man. You you probably would have gotten a chuckle. Uh, so back in the day, my very first ever copy of uh, Resident Evil 1, it was disc only because I bought it used. And I had the grand idea to uh, make my own custom cover for it (laughs) (laughs) on like line college ruled paper. I drew my own version of the stars logo and wrote, you know, Resident Evil director's cut from the files of stars. (laughs) That's still awesome, though. I actually I would have loved to see that. (laughs) And an old beat up DVD case. <laughs> oh man. I mean, I think we've all done that. I, I remember when I got a copy of Silent Hill, I print, printed out the cover on like just regular stock, like library paper, because I was at the library, cut it out and just shoved it in my game case. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it does the trick. 
Yeah. And uh, Silent Hill is not the type of game you just let set bare desk like that, you know? Yeah, it's like, there, now you know who you are. <laughs> you go, girl. Guy, whatever you want to be. CD case. You, you guy with a girl in your face. <laughs> Took me forever before I actually looked close enough at that cover. And I was like, oh, yeah, there's Sybil's face. There's there's Dahlia's face. There's just women everywhere in this poster. Mm-hmm. There goes that ear. Looks like something out of Alien. Uh, for Mad Hatter? Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> his hat's not usually like that, by the way. People are like... Wait, I'm looking at the characters. Hats. Blah, blah. It's like, yeah, I just did my own little creation. I think it looks better. <laughs> Plus, you shouldn't be trying to copy things. You should be trying to create. That's the whole point. Oh, I think this is where part two comes in because I, I remember sitting down the pen and I was like, or I need a cigarette or something. <laughs> <laughs> Our shitty audio from the first recording when I could hear my voice echo, echo. <laughs> echo, echo, echo. I was like, all right, we're going to end it here, people. Here's my Funasuki. Look at it again for the millionth time. But yeah, oh, oh. Oh shit, cameo. Mm -hmm. But uh, I gotta say, yeah, like go out there, reinvent. You know, even even if honestly, you know, if you're just starting out and you're not really quite up there with character building, a great practice is taking an established character and kind of redesigning them and establishing them in a completely different context. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like how some writers do great starting out in fan fiction, taking established characters and writing stories. Sometimes, you know, just unique stories that feel like they fit in the world and other times having them hook up with various other characters, sometimes outside the franchise. It's a dark rabbit hole. We're not going to go down that, but still. No, we're, <laughs> we're going straight into part two. <laughs> But yeah, you know, like, don't be afraid to be like, all right, I'm going to draw the Dins Disney princesses as Transformers. Oh, man. Uh, all right. Oh, so there's that the box, too, to the Alice. Um, that's the box they came in, and they all have these little special boxes, each figure. Actually, they're actually, they're pretty neat. And that... Uh, um. Gift wrapping right there is what I'm going to wrap Chavo's present in that's like two feet to the left right there. He can't see it, though. He's going to have to wait. <laughs> I still maintain it's it's probably a bomb. So if you don't hear from me from this point on, just, just know he did it. <laughs> I take full responsibility in nothing. <laughs> then no great power for you. Yeah. <laughs> what are you working on here? This is the arm. Ah, uh, okay. It's almost like he's kind of serving her up on a platter almost. Yeah. I should explain that um, half the time when I start sketching things out, I really don't take a great... Uh... I'm still working on taking in my surroundings. So it's like, oh, this is too big. I have to redraw it to make it smaller and like more, you know, accurate. And um, yeah, I'm too lazy to do that. And I don't have a lot of time on my hands. So it's just like, well, I, this is the way I drew it is what we're doing. And um, what, what Alice is standing on is actually her rabbit from the video game that she carries with her. Uh, at the beginning of the game, and it, I think it falls down into Wonderland with her. Oh, yeah, yeah, that stuffed rabbit she carries. Mm -hmm. 
that t- that talks to her in the intro. Alice, you need to wake, come back to Wonderland. And she's just like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Ritalin again. Hmm. A great little um, example of my unsteady arm is those two shadow lines I just drew. You can see the ridges in them. And that's why I usually have to go right over them again. I go back and forth, as you see. One of the things I do when I draw is I go back and forth over black lines. And uh, it almost, I'm almost retracing my own work. And that's the only way I can get a straight line is when I do that. Which is probably why all my lines are always thick, which sucks, because some lines are meant to be smaller to give it more accuracy to detail and shadow and depth. Are you drawing uh, his fingers underneath? I think I just draw the rabbit. Okay, gotcha. Or you mean the rabbit's fingers? I don't think... Do the rabbit have fingers? No, no. I was just making sure. No, I was thinking the hatter's fingers were underneath it. Mm, I think I draw the shadow for the ear is what that little, like, rectangle is. All right. I kind of swore the rabbit had a name, too. Possible. It's probably not, not going to pop up in my head till after we're done recording. Was it Snooky? Oh, God, I, I pray not. <laughs> But uh, here with the arm, and like I said, the shadow underneath here, just try to always be mindful of that as well. You know, where your light source is coming from when you're doing shadows. In this case, I didn't really work on the shadows too hard, but I I just assumed that there would be a shadow there in my subconscious mind. That's why it's there. That's why I drew it there. <laughs> it was just like, oh yeah, shadow. Deet. <laughs> You know, but just be free flow, especially about like things like hair or like the fuzzies on the rabbit here. Do not even think about it. Don't try to go and make any sort of like, oh, I'm going to do three rigid and then one curly and then one wild and then just just do whatever. Don't even think about it. That's the best way that it comes out. Yeah, this this isn't a Pixar movie where you have to calculate the... Uh physics of every single hair follicle on a character model Mm -hmm. yeah something has more weight when it's random as opposed to uh, perfect perfect type of uh, organization Sorry, I'm trying to get a sense for some of this mass here. It's always interesting to kind of see something as it's being drawn and, you know, watching it slowly come into focus the more details are added. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of envious of the artists who can do, like, a rough drawing and you're like, oh, man, there it is. There's the picture. Like when I when I do roughs, it's like, what, what's he drawing? And then when I start inking it, they're like, oh, it's like, yeah, I know. You have to tell me I suck. <laughs> Let's 
God, I keep forgetting I have to buy Sharpies. Another thing, too, about all these art projects is they cut, they get expensive over time. Oh, I, I would imagine. I uh, When I was uh, going to college and stuff, I browsed through the supplies for, you know, pens and other stuff when I was working on, like, stage design and costume design and just be baffled at how much, you know, paper, pens, the proper color utensils, all of that shit just kind of adds up. Mm-hmm. Like the Bristol paper I use, I think is, I don't know, it's like, it's like $20 or something, $15. And then I usually get like two of those. And then after that, you got your, your Funosuke pens. Those are 15 for five. And then two gigantic Sharpies. There's like another $5. So you're already at like 45 bucks at this point. That's not even including pencils and. You know, the most important thing, time, <laughs> that oh. you can't get back. Oh, man, that, that reminds me of my high school days. I had a lot of artist friends who uh, just just love getting a simple mechanical pencil and just going nuts in their notebook. Yeah, the best thing, because then you can just erase constantly. <laughs> or you know the graphite would fucking smear everywhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> like on this paper could almost turn this into a postcard wish you were here instead of me <laughs> <laughs> have you gone mad too all the best people are. We've all gone mad here. <laughs> yeah, this is... Don't ever use the brush pen like this to fill in blacks. Just get a Sharpie or a Micron. I was just, again, doing this because I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to... Really use this one. <laughs> it's a waste of good ink. How did you feel about the uh, sequel they eventually did for this? You know, I actually fell asleep during it, and I didn't go back. <laughs> um, and I had it on loud on the TV. Like, that's how hard I crashed in it. <laughs> it's just, I dozed the fuck off. And then it, it was so loud when something, like, happened, some sort of action or something. Wait, wait. I'm I'm talking about the sequel to American McGee's Alice. What oh, I thought you meant the Tim Burton movie. <laughs> oh God, no, no. I I'm trying not to talk about that, Stefan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excuse me for even. Let's just gloss over that. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Madness Returns. Um, it sucks because I think I beat it twice in like a week i beat it once really fast and i realized i beat it really fast and i was like well i i should beat it again just to get the full thing because at the time i didn't i wasn't really able to keep games like i'd rent them or something and uh so i kind of blew through it but i will say other than like the geisha part of it which i guess american mcgee was living in japan or something uh, well, it also could be uh, reflecting on uh, the British, uh, I don't want to say obsession, the British interest in the Orient, especially since uh, in terms of trade, they actually had a pretty strong influence. Mm hmm. Yeah, so it was whatever the culmination of those levels were, those were the only levels in the sequel that I didn't find attractive in any way. I just thought they fell out of place and. I didn't like the little platforming segments with the teapots and everything and Alice going around. Uh, it, it just didn't gel with me, especially what we got in the first game. Um, 
I think my favorite part of the Madness Returns were the more like Mario Sunshine levels where you're just kind of like on a maze platform thing. You have to figure out where to go. And then the junkyard, I think it's called, where there's just like like evil Toy Story baby heads like walking at you or something. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that was supposed to like represent innocence lost or something. Mm hmm. But I, 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 you know, that's the thing. I, I'd buy it again if there was a place to buy it. <laughs> but it was made by EA, so. Um, unless you want to go through the bullshit of uh, Origin, I guess. Mm hmm. Well, how much is it on Origin, do you know? Not off the top of my head. Yeah. I do know if you get it, though, you'll actually get access to both that game and uh, I, I don't think it's paid DLC. Like, I think you straight up get a free copy of American McGee's Alice, the original, to go with it. Okay. Yeah, actually, I already have it, but yeah, it'd still be cool to have it, another copy, I guess, somewhere. Well, considering it's hard to get, like, you know, get, get the original game with a legit you know, whether it's buying the disc or having a PS3 or a 360 and getting it through Madness Returns or getting it through the PC version through Origin. Well, what do you think of the sequel? I enjoyed it. I do feel like there was a little bit of the whimsy of the original game kind of lost in translation, but this is supposed to be an older, even more hardened Alice, considering that happy ending we see at the end of the first game wasn't so happy in reality. Mm -hmm. Like she got out, but she still uh, had quite a bit to uh, unpack and deal with in her life. It didn't bother me personally, but I can understand how some of the retcons in that game might upset people, considering they expand uh, the tragedy of what happened to her family from a fire caused by her cat Dinah to, turns out, her, uh, her sister was raped and murdered by some dude who had a crush on her, and he set the fire to cover his tracks. Mm-hmm. Who, oh, spoiler alert uh, for Alice Madness Returns, turns out to be Alice's fucking therapist in the sequel who's trying to make her forget everything. Very odd choice of uh, characterization and backstory. Very odd. Yeah. Basically, uh, the, the catalyst for the sequel is... This therapist is fucking with her mind, trying to make her forget and, you know, scramble her brains so that she uh, can't tell on him, so to speak, you know, piece together what happened. And it ends up backfiring. Basically, though, she has to, to keep her sanity and to keep her head together, she has to go through Wonderland and undo his damage. Basically, yeah. Uh, I think the highlights of that game would probably be the fact that you do get a little bit more. I mean, it looks like a fable game almost taking place during the industrial revel revolution, but it's, it's not, it's just, it just looks like that. And you're just kind of in this, those like towns of the same aesthetic. I don't know. I I did like wandering around town, though, and kind of getting more of outside of Wonderland as opposed to always being in Wonderland the whole time. I think I liked it the first time, but going back to I think we kind of just... I think it would have been better if we just stayed in Wonderland the whole time. Uh, I don't know. I like the, the way they have us touching back and forth between reality and Wonderland, especially how it culminates in the ending where she's in a mismatched, you know, Wonderland, London. Wonder London, I guess. Mm-hmm. Take a... Was it the blue pill? Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> right, the game kind of just goes full on sucker punch in terms of its themes of uh, escapism. 
Oh man, it goes hardcore into it. Which is totally normal, you know, especially for an abuse victim. Is, you know, imagine using your imagination to escape a harsh reality is nothing new. Mm hmm. That's what I do every day. That's how I get through uh, hours and hours of working in retail. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I think there was a whole day once where I just thought about a story I was going to write and I just kept thinking about it all day. I was like, okay. Now, what's the next part? You know, and like, granted, I'm working, but really my mind was just so somewhere else. And I, I've had days like that. Yeah. Only important thing is if you care enough about the story, you know, and you're going through it part by part in your head, always write, always write down stuff, always write it down, get it down on paper, and then you get, give your mind permission to move on to the next bit. Mm hmm. Don't, don't be a dumbass like me where I was like, man, that's going to be so awesome. I'm going to write that down. And then just like, as soon as I get off work, fuck, I forgot it. That's happened to me a couple times. So angry. And it's like, it's, it's just, it's like, it's locked out of your brain and it's out there, but you can't bring it back. And it's like, oh. There's been a couple of writers who that they said they carry around journals because they never want to not be able to write down an idea or a story they heard or some factoid or something. And I just can't do that because I have a phone. <laughs> I just take notes in there. <laughs> but I get what they mean by that because it's true. You do forget sometimes. And it's a sad thing when you do because it would probably would have been an amazing story. Uh, well, here's hoping that they pop back in eventually. Mm hmm. Man. Yeah, and this, this whole part with the hair on the rabbit was um, really just an afterthought. Um, I was actually not going to add too much hair to him. Uh, I was going to let the. Uh, rabbit that she's standing on do more of the hairy fuzzy bits of the picture and then this was just going to be less structured and more of like oh here's two hairs on his side so you know it's a rabbit and that was it uh, I think it came out nice really uh, adds to the texture yeah appreciate it Yeah, some gnarly looking chompers. I know. I, oh my god, I kept thinking like it's gonna look like a walrus. <laughs> no, no, it works, especially considering his chompers already look pretty gnarly in the game. Yeah. Everything's supposed to look sharp, uncomfortable, and uninviting. That's true. It is the aesthetic of the game. It's very bizarre, but I love it. Like anyone watching this, type in America McGee's Alice world map or map, level map, and just look at that that beautiful art of just what Wonderland looks like that they did for the world map. And it, it unlocks a new area every time you progress in the game. It's just, just, just amazing. Now that I'm remembering, too, I think Alice grows huge in the sequel doesn't she isn't there a part where she eats a flower or something yeah yeah it touches on the eat me drink me thing mm -hmm. uh, i think it's an actual mechanic where she can just she can grow absolutely huge huge and just slaughter everything yeah that's badass now now i'm gonna buy it on origin god damn it chava look what you did <laughs> Well, if you want to circumvent it, you can always just say fuck it and get a PS3. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you did. Look what you did. It's all your fault. <laughs> and no more wire hangers. Or Alice game recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's a shame we'll never get a part three. Oh, man. I shouldn't say never, actually, because, I mean, hell, the sequel itself, 
was uh, uh, far like I never thought the game would get a sequel to begin with. Same. But there was there was a few different iterations of it. I think there was one where it was. I think there was an actual MMO sequel planned at one point where it would have basically had Alice helping solve other people's emotional problems. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think it was a, there like it went through a lot of different iterations. Like I think it was a series at one point where Alice would have been, you know, the like little mini stories where she's helping people. And then I think at some point it turned into an MMO and then it just kind of fizzled out into nothing. And I mean, it's not like the demand isn't there. I mean, hell, before Madness Returns came out, there was a wonderful uh, claymation trailer someone did of, uh, of pitching an Alice sequel where uh, she's talking to her therapist and then it turns out to be the Cheshire Cat. And the animation is just stunning. Like you, I would have thought it was professional. <laughs> yeah. I have to watch that. Oh, definitely. It makes the actual uh, Madness Returns teaser trailer look like shit in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is an EA game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big difference between EA then versus now. Uh, but it's not like they weren't adverse to making bad decisions from the get-go. I mean, hell, this game was originally, uh, the first Alice was originally supposed to get a PS2 port, but for one reason or another, it just ended up getting canceled, which is a shame. I, I think it would have been, a, a big contender for a greatest hits title. It would have, I 100% would have bought that on PS2. I'd probably own it right now still and play it if it came out on PS2. It's. And we talked about this last time, too. It's like when Resident Evil 4 came out on Res- on PS2, it sold a hell of a lot more because Capcom was just waiting for that, too, because it, it did nothing on the GameCube. And it's supposed to be an exclusive and all that, and everyone knows the history. But, yeah, it really didn't do well. And uh, I bought it day one. I still have my <laughs> Resident Evil 4 GameStop uh, limited edition red case, whatever it is. Oh, but, the Steelbook? The steel book, but it just it just underperformed, and Capcom's like, God damn it, we need to put it on PS2. And they should have done the same thing with Alice, because it would have, it really would have succeeded. And I believe today, if they did a third one, it would be so, or a remake even. Oh my God, a remake of the first one, I'd welcome it. Yeah, I think a remake would actually be probably more likely than a sequel. Mm-hmm. But that's if they can get American McGee back. Because I have a feeling it's one of those things where, bad decisions aside, they do understand that trying to do it without him would actually not bode well, especially mm-hmm. with the fans. Yeah. I mean, he really had the genesis for this, and out of the people who left it, you know, he, I don't want to say he became one of the most successful, but he had one of the best brands that I liked it. You know, John Romero did Daikatana, and... <laughs> Everyone else went on to like little cheesy dumb games or games that were eventually be clones of doom or quake and you know so I mean the dude had a future and you know I I think he made the right decision by choosing to do Alice Daikatana that's that's going to be an interesting uh, episode in the future at some point, I think. <laughs> Katana, that's a name I haven't heard since a long time. Since John Romero was allegedly going to make me his bitch. Ah, <laughs> uh, the good old days. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the. That that brief moment in the nineties when hubris was apparently dead. Yeah. Uh, there was a couple stars in that era. John Romero was definitely one of them. But he seems like a genuinely good guy. And apparently it wasn't there's some promoter he paid who came up with that. It wasn't his idea. 
Hmm, I'll take that with a grain of salt. Maybe, maybe, maybe perspective on certain things definitely uh, changed in the uh, years since that. What I'm sure is a very humbling experience. Yeah, I well, because he he elaborated elaborated on it a little bit, and he said something like, "You know, I would never say make you my bitch." He's he said something like, "I." I would annihilate you or kill you. He's like, that's what I really want to do. I would slice you in half. Like, those are the things I would say in my grammar. I would never say I want to make you my bitch. Because that would be rewarding you. And I, no, I just want to kill you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So when he said that and he elaborated, I was like, yeah, he probably would, probably would have said, you know, John Romero is going to annihilate you. That sounds more like his... It's not the real verbiage I personally would have used, but uh, yeah, <laughs> his candor seemed open at the time. But we are coming close to the end of the drawing here, and um, you're like, but wait, there's so much more to draw. Uh, we still have about nine and a half minutes till we're gonna end this, but. I, I just went as far as I could with the brush pen. Again, it takes me a while to upload these videos. And I just really wanted to get a feel for it, to show it to everybody, kind of give everyone my take on it, which is that it's it's way better than any of the other pens I use. There's nothing wrong with Microns. I still love them. But there's just something about a brush pen that just they can't do. And uh, that's why I would recommend using it, because, you know, it's... It's it's really a matter of what you prefer, and that can even include doing digital art, whatever the hell it is. Um, I, I I prefer digital just because it goes faster. You know, if I make a mistake on paper, I have to turn the pen around or the pencil around, erase it, and I got a little erasing there that you could still see all that stuff. But I do I will always admit that pen to paper looks way better than digital. Digital almost sometimes can look empty. Especially if it's colored or drawn a certain way. You know, because there's definitely shortcuts you can take in digital drawing that you can't do on paper. So uh, my my advice when you're doing this, when you're getting to learn how to ink, is first learn how to draw. Don't even think about inking. Um, and then when you get good, you know, confident at drawing, then go ahead and go to brush pens i mean it's not like you can't learn both at the same time but you definitely have to take more time to learn how to draw not that inking isn't hard either but yeah this is this was really just to test this out again i have a couple sketches already out right now that i've done so there's going to be maybe one or two of these inking with the tombow again just to give you an even more in-depth thing with a different drawing, with different characters drawn differently, different shadows. I'll actually include more shadows next time. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. But though there will be a time lapse here at the end. Got anything to say, Chavo, in the next six and a half minutes? Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Yay, God! <laughs> um... Gosh, I guess um, in reference to the pen and paper versus digital, it's really, I I feel like it really depends on what your purpose with the art is going to be, whether you're pitching professional work, crafting something for a commission or a friend or whatever. But uh, I also second, you know, learning how to draw before you ink, you know, and just practice with the cheaper stuff first, you know, kind of get a bearings, build the muscle memory before you start sinking in a ton of money on fancy pens and papers and other art supplies. Yeah, it's very true. Art is expensive. <laughs> be like be like my friends in high school who started with their mechanical pencils and notebooks. And then work their way up to, you know, actual drafting pens and brushes and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, buy a ruler. I got to tell you, (laughs) a ruler will help you out so much. No shame in a ruler. Penciling everything. Yeah. 
uh, it's it's a weird it's a weird thing to have in your kit, but it it uh, man, there's just so many videos I could do on rulers. Uh, yeah, so those sharpies as I'm showing, that's what I use to fill in my blacks. The ink sucks on sharpies. I don't know if they make like gigantic microns. I highly doubt it. But a micron eight right there, that's the size I use for microns. As you can see, it's it's a little bit more of a thicker uh, end there. The Fudenosuke has the thickest of them all, but you're able to control it because it's a brush. Uh, microns, if you really wanted to control them, you'd have to get a knife and cut off half the end there, and then you could use it almost as a quilt pen. Um, but, yeah. Got the Cheshire Cat. I promise I do finish the bunny. I don't know if people would have preferred me to draw that over the, or not the Cheshire Cat, but the White Rabbit. You want me to... You want to take a picture of what you're drawing, Chava, and we could just put it at the end, too, for people? No, 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 no. <laughs> Are don't you, you sure? Put, don't you put me on the spot like that. <laughs> Watch, it's like this beautiful painting, this beautiful drawing. It's a, everyone's minds. It's a, it's a reimagining of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. <laughs> with all Resident Evil characters. <laughs> <laughs> Nemesis is God. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but no, man, I, I got a lot of respect for what you do. And I I myself am just a amateur who does it mostly for kicks. And, you know, it's more of a hobby for me. It's not really a career aspiration. I, I can't I can't trick myself into thinking is like oh no maybe I can be a good one and I'm just like nah I, I know my strengths. <laughs> yeah, I will say if anyone thinks where I think my strengths lie, I actually think I'm a better writer than an artist. So <laughs> again, uh, I should plug it before we head out of here. Expect an announcement on the Kickstarter soon. I'm actually going to make a full video kind of leading up to the announcement at the end of that video, and that video is going to consist more of, uh, you know, my history with comic books and how I grew up with them and stuff like that. It's it's just a long, long video with many different cuts, so it's going to take a while to work on. But other than that, yeah, I appreciate everyone being here. As Chavo said, you know, and I said, just keep practicing, try harder, um, if anyone does use a brush pen, let me know if you know any tricks. Maybe I can do a video about that. I don't know. Something. Leave a comment below, like, subscribe, all that crap. I'm just glad if anyone hangs around to watch this. Because uh, as painstakingly hard as these are to get from my phone to my computer, I still enjoy doing them. Hey, if it's, if it's uh, if there's no joy in it, it's not worth doing, right? Right. So let's see. I'm gonna see if I can pull up a American McGee's Alice quote before we leave here. Let's see if we got a good one. Hmm. Uh, speaking on her backstory about her family dying in a burning fire, one of the things she says is, they ta taunt me about the burning as if I were to blame. I clear them from my conscience with the eloquence of my blade. Ooh. <laughs> 
And she also says I'm not edible. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's one of the good things about the soundtrack. They actually have little voice clips from her, like kind of sprinkled throughout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're gonna head out of here right now. <laughs> Thanks for everyone tuning in. Uh, if anyone's wondering why Webb is in here, it's because he was I don't know doing something else, but <laughs> he's never played the games either, so. He'll be on other episodes, I'm sure. Uh, Hi, Web. Yeah. Hi, Web. Bye, Web. But uh, thanks for everyone tuning in. I hope this was entertaining. It's the second time we had to record this. So we tried our best. And um, yeah, that's uh, America McGee's Alice. And now time for the time lapse video. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Stay mad. And like and subscribe to the channel if you see fit to do so. All right. Bye. Have a good one, guys. Mm-hmm. Ooh. If you want to destroy my sweater, whoa, 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 hold this thread as I walk away.